Hello and welcome to the award-winning Tough Girl podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. Today, I'm thrilled to announce a special collaboration with Innovate, a world-renowned and ambitious sportswear pioneer. Innovate will be sponsoring the Tough Girl podcast throughout the month of June with new episodes going live every Tuesday and Thursday at 7am UK time. Innovate is a UK-based company and it is their mission to empower the world's physical and mental fitness through more fulfilling sporting experiences. I've been wearing Innovate trainers and sportswear since 2019 on all my adventures and challenges around the world, most recently over in New Zealand while I walked the Tierra Roa Trail and in Spain when I was on the Camino Viva de la Plata. With Innovate support, I'm able to continue showcasing incredible female role models who take on adventures and physical challenges. Stay tuned for an incredible episode filled with stories, insights, top tips and advice to motivate and inspire you. To find out more about Innovate, visit the Tough Girl website or search Innovate Sportswear online. You can also use the discount code TOUGHGIRL15, TOUGHGIRL15 to get 15% off your next order. My name is Kristin Tua. I'm 29 years old, originally from Norway, but living in London now where I work in human rights. And I have been a through hiker for the last nine years. And so I've tried to delve into lots of different outdoor adventures, have done some of the big trails of the world, such as the John Muir Trail in the US, the GR20 in Corsica and the Teararoa in New Zealand, which is my biggest one. And also just a really avid outdoor person, really into climbing and horse trekking as well. And politically, I've also been really engaged in women's rights. And so I try through um, my outdoor website where I write about my adventures to kind of combine the two. Kristen, have you always been outdoorsy? You know, what what was your family life like? What was it like growing up in Norway? Yeah, I probably will say growing up in Norway, you do end up being quite outdoorsy, whether you want it or not, because you typically go to the mountains for your holidays. And we have a small, very rustic cabin in the mountains that we used to go to. And so I'm an only child of divorced parents, but I would go on little outdoor escapades with both my mom, which was a bit more civilized in the forest. And my dad and I used to go exploring around the cabin in the mountains a lot. But I would say that I never really identified as sporty growing up. So when we did go hiking, I was very much kind of like a Goldilocks type of hiker who was like, oh, I don't want to go uphill and I don't want to go more than so, so many hours. And I really hated PE. I mean, I was an only child to the core, so I hated team sports. I was really stubborn and strong-willed, so I didn't really kind of enjoy any activities that weren't on my terms, <laughs> which sounds a bit toxic, but that's kind of how I was when I um, when I grew up. And this lasted all the way into my teens. I would like, I would, uh, I would go horse riding and stuff, which was very much my sport growing up. But I wasn't particularly interested in hiking or kind of any outdoorsy or sporty things beyond that. Um, so the turning point for me, uh, when I really kind of discovered through hiking came, um, in my undergraduate years, uh, when I was 20, I had a very, very difficult uh, time in undergrad. I was quite, uh, I, I experienced some bullying from my fellow students and I felt really alone. And I was just a bit kind of socially cut off from, from everyone. And it ended up with me becoming um, really depressed. And so I struggled with that for, for a really long time. And then I just kind of, I was really seeking something that would make my life feel purposeful again. I think we all want our lives to feel extraordinary to us anyway. And I was really looking for something that would kind of give me something to hold on to. And so uh, in the middle of my undergraduate years, when I was kind of at the bottom of my life, I read um, Wild by Cheryl Strayed, which is now a very popular outdoor memoir about Cheryl Strayed, who hikes the Pacific Crest Trail. And when I read Wild, I was like, yes, this is it. This is what I need to catapult myself out of this bottom and find something extraordinary in my life and kind of do this for myself. So I immediately just Googled great trails of the world and the Te Araroa in New Zealand came up and I didn't even think about it for two seconds. I was like, yes, this is what I'm going to do. And this is what I have to do. This is this is going to be like the key to the key to making my life better. So uh, yeah, I didn't even think about it for a second, and I just started planning. <laughs> and so 
I dragged myself through the rest of my undergrad because I knew that if I didn't do the degree, then I never would. Literally kind of kept myself alive for that time so that I could complete this trail. And what I really wanted to do was to repeat Cheryl Strade's successes, but to learn from her failures. So I knew that in order to take on such a big through hike like the Te Araroa, I had to start a bit smaller. So I decided that I was going to pick a trail that was much closer to home to begin with. So I ended up hiking the West Highland Way in Scotland, which is probably the UK's most popular national trail, because I just wanted to see whether I could enjoy hiking by myself and whether the logistics of camping and packing and resupply and all that stuff, whether that was something that I could be good at. And so I set out on the West Highland Way as my first through hike ever and feeling, you know, so pumped up on the victory of, you know, actually doing it. You know, I was walking on the edge of these really rainy fields uh, in the suburbs of Glasgow and just being like, I am an Amazonian queen <laughs> and just feeling so, so high on the victory of it all. And as a first trail, I would say it was a really good baptism of fire in the sense that I made so many gear mistakes. I got terrible blisters. It rained all the time, but it was still my first experience of people's kindness out there on the trail. So especially I think as a solo woman hiker, we tend to think that the world is kind of like a hostile place and, and people are out to get us, but that's really not the case. It's rather the opposite. Like everyone was always so keen to help me and locals would like drive me around and let me stay in their Airbnbs like off season. And it was just really, everyone was super nice and always trying to to help me out. So after I did the West Highland Way, I was like, yeah, you know, my, my feet are terrible, so I need new shoes. But apart from that, I can definitely tackle a bigger trail. And that's how um, I came to do the John Muir Trail as well, because I was like, okay, I can do something that's, you know, quote unquote, local to me in Europe, but I need to find out whether I can hike far. And the John Muir Trail, which goes uh, on a section of the Pacific Crest Trail through the Sierra Nevada in California, is a very tough trail. The elevation profile's pretty sick. You end up going up to like four and a half thousand meters. There are bears there, so you have to carry food in your bear canister. And that was just a really intense experience where I was like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, I've never hiked until now. Um, but it was still so beautiful and I absolutely loved it. And after having completed both the West Highland Way and the John Muir Trail, I was like, yes, I can hike by myself and I can hike far. So I can hike the Te Araroa. And at that point, I was 22 and ready to go. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for sharing that because I actually really like hearing the progression of a journey and actually it it seems so lo it seems so logical when you explain it you know doing like the West Island Way sort of you know, a shorter for your first hike just to figure out the gear and, and the trainers and like you know can I can I do this and then going that slightly further afield but not committing to you, you know those bigger longer thousand plus kilometer uh tracks but I'm I'm intrigued to ask you why I suppose you focused on the TA rather than the Pacific Crest Trail after reading Cheryl Strade's book Wild and being so inspired by. It. I mean, she she's incredible. She's actually she has been on the Tough Girl podcast many years ago um, to talk more about you know her her journey and her life. Was there a specific reason? Yeah, so uh, there actually is. It's, it's a good question. So I'd been to New Zealand twice before because I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan. <laughs> and so I knew that I really loved New Zealand. I'd been there. I kind of knew what the country looked like. I knew that the people were lovely. I had a sense of kind of like how to, how to navigate the infrastructure and where to, where I would uh, need to go in order to like get to the trail and stuff. So I just, New Zealand really felt like home and New Zealand had been such a huge inspiration to me when I was a bit younger, like in my teens, because I was a big fantasy nerd. And so I just felt like, you know, yes, if there was ever a country where I'm supposed to be realizing this dream, it has to be New Zealand. And the great thing I think about the Te Araroa, specifically the South Island and New Zealand, as opposed to maybe the through hikes in America, is that New Zealand is such a small country but it's so varied. Like the landscapes are so varied. It's like five countries in the area of one. And so for those of us who don't have like the longest attention span or who aren't like the, the most patient people, I think New Zealand is just such a great through hike because it, the landscape completely changes every few days. 
So for the Te Arara was divided into sections. And with every new section on the South Island, the landscape just looks completely different. So unlike Pacific Crest Trail, where, you know, you'll hike in the desert for weeks and then you hike through the mountains and the forests for several weeks and then the mountains change a bit for a few weeks. It's every five days or so, the landscape just changes completely. And so it really gives you that variation and the constant inspiration that I do think that you need on a through hike. Cause I think, you know, through hikes are very demanding uh, endeavors. And, you know, you look back on the pictures when you're well fed and well rested in your living room, like years after, and you're like, yeah, that was amazing. But then when you're out there on the trail, even a really beautiful day can feel really hard. So I think that having a bit of Having a bit of variation and just breaking it down mentally into smaller pieces is really useful um, for when you're just going through it and you're tired and you're sleeping badly and you might be really hot and just a bit tired of all that splendid nature for a bit. And yeah, I think variation really does help with that. But I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It ultimately stemmed from me being a huge Lord of the Rings fan. <laughs> <laughs> and to be fair, New Zealand is that beautiful. Like, <laughs> yeah. like what, what you see in those movies is what you do get over there. Before, before you started out, so, you know, you, you, you've been on your, your practice through heights in, in Scotland and on the John Muir Trail, but did you have any specific concerns or worries or anything that you were, uh, that you were, sl- yeah, like I suppose concerned about before heading off to take on, uh, you know, the South Island of New Zealand? It's a good question. So I didn't have any specific concerns related to my safety because I know that, you know, statistically being in the wild is pretty much the safest place you can be when it comes to violent crime and stuff like that. And I think I also came from a through hiking for me, came from a place of necessity. Like I very existentially felt that this was something that I had to do. And so there's there's a passage in Wild where Cheryl Strait says that, you know, she's not afraid of the worst thing happening because the worst thing already had uh, back when her mother died. And for me, I think it came from kind of the same place that the worst thing had already happened in the sense that I felt terrible and I was really miserable and unhappy with my life. And so I just kind of instinctively latched onto this idea that through hiking was going to make everything better. And of course... I was like 21, 22. I didn't think too much about like, well, you know, how am I going to balance the nutrition and how am I going to get enough sleep? And what if my knees uh, get really funky after a few hundred Ks? And stuff that I think about now at, you know, the ripe old age of my late 20s. But back then I was just like, no, this is going to be amazing. And I remember sitting on the plane from Oslo to to buy when I was heading, heading for New Zealand and just being like, this is it. <laughs> but that was the only moment of kind of like butterflies that I had because I was just like, yes, this is what my life is all about. You know, everything has been building towards this moment. And, you know, some people where I left have kind of been questioning whether me taking on that journey was kind of me running away from my problems and like running away from my life. And I was like, no, 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 this is me walking into my life. And there is definitely a difference. But I'm, yeah. I just want to, like, um, I suppose just get a little little bit more. If I, you shared a little bit more around, like, your mental health, you know, having to deal with that bullying and how it's going through university and just, you know, having such a tough time and, you know, feeling very low, feeling very depressed about it. Did your healing journey, did that start almost as soon as you, you'd, not read like Wild and Cheryl Strayed, but you got the idea of doing the TA. But when you started heading out to to Scotland and you know doing John Moore Trail, or or had that healing journey not really started until you were actually out in New Zealand, away, like away, away from mm-hmm. like Norway and those people? Um, you know, when did the healing journey really start for you? If you're able to pinpoint it, yeah, no, it's a good question, and I think. But a lot of people who undertake these really big journeys, they're they're looking for something, you know, like a lot of through hikers and a lot of people who who do like big expeditions and stuff. Many of them have gone through like some kind of life crisis or they're not exactly looking. They're not exactly sure what they're looking for, but it is something and they're looking to change in like some kind of way. And I think, you know, my life changed kind of incrementally. You know, I finished my degree. uh, I got like a new social environment. I entered a relationship that had just become really toxic and wasn't good for me. So I'd certainly already taken some steps like in my everyday life to begin that healing journey. I probably should have had therapy. It didn't. (laughs) 
but my life had already kind of begun to change a bit. But interestingly, I really wanted to undertake the TA solo because when I was at university, it was other people that were the source of my misery, or I kind of saw them as, you know, like these people are making my life really difficult. And so all I need is to be alone. Um, but actually hiking alone really made me appreciate other people. And that's something that I say a lot now in my everyday life to, to my friends that I appreciate them so much because the greatest adventures of all lie in other people. But I think hiking alone really showed me that. And that was really valuable in its own way. When you, when you were sharing earlier about, you know, wanting to take on, on this through hike to help you continue sort of your journey of sort of healing part of me was thinking oh my goodness this is so almost like so much pressure because what if you get to the end of the trip and you like nothing has changed oh yeah and I'm not gonna lie I did think about that as well when I was out there I was like oh god what if I don't notice that I've changed or what if I haven't changed in like the ways that I wanted and I think especially after you finished a through hike it's really common to feel like that because a lot of people experience what's called like the post failed blues just because you're back to your normal life, you're feeling a bit lost, you've been through this incredible adventure that you can't really explain or articulate to people, no one really understands it, you're used to being out in nature all the time and with all these endorphins and all of a sudden you're kind of like coming crashing back to earth. So that's a bit of a transition. But I will say, like looking back on my through hikes now and even sort of like immediately after, they really are like the crown jewels of my life, the TA in particular. And I do think that they... They just gave me so much strength and resilience and really put me in the way of beauty. Again, I'm just quoting Cheryl Strait all over the place. But having such a self-powered journey really gave me that sense of like owning the extraordinary and that what I was doing was just so cool (laughs) that when I was out there and when I'm out there still, I just feel like, you know, of all the lives that I could have lived, I'm living this one. And it is so amazing. Because, I mean, just picking up on on what you said, like, I think through hiking for me was about like learning how to bear what I couldn't bear. And I think it applies both in the literal sense and in the metaphorical sense. And when I reached the that iconic yellow sign at Bluff at the end of the Tierra Roa, which was after, you know, 1400 kilometers and 64 days, the achievement wasn't just about carrying the pack across all those miles, but of course, like carrying myself and my heart and my head as well. And while it might be a bit of like a cheesy lesson, but when I thought back standing in that car park uh, on the trail experience, the finish line itself didn't seem as like the biggest achievement. Although, of course, it's very symbolic that you've you've gone all the way to the end. But what sticks out was really the incredible moments that I had along the way on that journey. So it's kind of like a classic, it's the journey, not the destination. But I think about it a lot in relation to our society and how like goal-oriented we are, how results-driven we are. Whereas I think the true happiness of a human experience, like what makes our animal brains happy, is really being present in the process and enjoying just all the beautiful things that you see along the way. So um, I do try to remind myself of that now um, when I through hike, because I think a lot of through hikers tend to like rush a bit. You know, you're like, oh, got to make big miles, got to get to Canada. But now I'm much more sort of tuned into um, swimming in every water hole and walking a bit slowly, looking at moss and trees and stuff. So even though I like to hike fast, I still try to to revel in those small moments because that's really what makes the journey. Do you know, I so relate to that because I still remember I finished uh, Marathon de Saabs and I basically got the medal around my neck, had, uh, you know, this goal I've been working towards like 18 months, medal around my neck. And I like had two minutes in that of joy. And then it was over. Yeah. And because of that experience, it really made me reflect quite deeply on like, cause I am actually, I'm a very goal. I write goals. I have to do lists. I have adventure to do lists. You know, I, I, I had these goals of things that I want to achieve and you know with, with deadlines and etc and actually what what I realized after that experience is well and to be honest, I think this is a joy to realize this once you figure this out it, it sort of changes the equation a bit because exactly the same as you it's 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 cheesy as it sounds for me it's never about like the final day and reaching the end 
it's it is literally the journey that you are on and what you are learning along the way and this the growth that you are experiencing as a person in able to get to the end of the the end of end of the trail the end of the end of that journey and, and especially i think what's wonderful is because uh the south island of new zealand is still pretty fresh in fresh in my mind as i did it earlier on um this year like i can see some of the photos on your on your blog let's track it and i'm literally like been there oh, i've got the exact same <laughs> one of the photos i'm like i've got the exact same photo from the exact same spot I, i'd love for you to share you know some of those incredible moments that you had, you know, what were some of your favorite sections that really, you know, even like I'm smiling as I'm talking, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that you look back on and you're just like, wow. And, and by the way, I also do understand that that's a very difficult question because <laughs> South Island particularly is incredible. Yeah, no, absolutely. But I have definitely, I've had a lot of time to think about this and there are like very clear moments that do stand out. So I think my two favorite sections on the Te Araroa, um was the Nelson Lakes, which is a classic. Like you come out of the previous section, like the Richmond Ranges, and you're just absolutely dead because it's so intense and there's a lot of foliage. So you haven't really had that many views. But when you come to the Nelson Lakes, it's just these incredible mountains. And I think the clearest lake in the world, Blue Lake, that has an underwater visibility of like 60 something meters. And it's just the most incredible, incredible landscape. So that was my favorite. Um, that was probably my favorite section, but also the two thumb range, which I feel was a bit undersold back when I started the TA. The two thumb range is just quite a small section of trail in between, um, Mesopotamia station, which for the Lord of the Rings fans is where, um, the location for Edoras is and like Tekabo village. So it kind of marks the halfway point of the South Island. And it's just this. It's kind of barren, but it's mountains, but it's all yellow tussock. There are no trees. It's just this sea of gold and then sky. Like we didn't have any cloud or anything almost on the whole trail. So it was just, it was just the sea of gold and the blue sky. And I think especially in New Zealand, the skies are so big. Like you feel like the sky really starts at your feet when you're there. Because the world is just blue and gold and you just feel like you're walking in the sky the entire time. So those were my my two favorite sections. And I think my favorite, probably my favorite through hiking moment of all time came in the Nelson Lakes just the day after we had crossed over Waiau Pass, which is probably the most famous day on the whole uh, TA because you cross over the pass. And then when you look back, you see Lake Constance, which is this beautiful sapphire of a lake that kind of glistens there behind you. And it's it's really amazing. But the day after is almost like a bit of a transport day between Waiau Hut and Anne Hut. But it's this enormous golden valley um, that goes next to the Ada homestead. And I just had this moment when I was in that Golden Valley, which was on, I believe, day 19 uh, of walking, where I just felt like some of the happiest I've felt in my entire life. And like I had a moment where I was like, oh my God, this is the happiest moment of my life, <laughs> where I was, um, I was just feeling so energetic and I had my favorite music on. And I was just running, like literally running down those trails. I was like so high on adrenaline and this amazing scenery. You know, you're part of this enormous landscape. And I just felt like I was flying. Like I was like literally running and like laughing like a lunatic, <laughs> like running down this valley, just feeling that kind of happiness that vibrates through every single cell in your body. And it's just the absolute opposite of how you feel when you're, you know, when you're depressed and you're really listless and you feel like nothing has meaning. Whereas now I'm just being drawn forward by the kind of magnetic pull of the trail. And yeah, the landscapes are incredible and you feel so powerful and free. And it's just, oh yeah, it's the best feeling in the world. For someone who used to hate PE, that is the best feeling in the world. It makes me remember there was, um, there was there were some points where like I would stop and I would just like look around and like just how you you know these incredible blue skies these, these mountain ranges just mountains on mountains on mountains these views on views on views and at one point like I always got like a little bit emotional it's like it's like so few people will get to see to see like some of these places because they're just so remote in the middle of nowhere 
And I remember sort of like tearing up at one point. I was I was getting quite emotional. And then I realized, oh, I'm probably about to start my period. <laughs> but, but it's still like exactly as you described it. It is, you know, it is or awe, awe inspiring. This I, I don't have the words to almost um, <laughs> to describe it. But on the flip side of that, there must also have been those challenging moments, those challenging times where because as we know on a through hike, it is not all sunshine and rainbows and beautiful views. You know, you do have those challenging days, which I I think sometimes people don't talk about enough. And sometimes then when people do go out on their their through hike, they're like, oh oh like this is this is not what I saw on my Instagram on my Instagram stories and when I read you know those blog posts etc but I suppose what were some of the more challenging moments for you and and how did you handle those those times yeah so it's a very good point that you're making and I kind of say to people who are like oh through act might be fun I'm like oh you're not gonna think it's fun when you're you know 50 days in and just wanting to get the first hitch into Burger Town uh no, I think, yeah, the section after Nelson Lakes for me was super tough. At that point, I was going further than I had on the John Muir Trail. So I had never, I had never hiked that far that long ever in my life. And one thing that I really wasn't paying attention to, which I think about a lot more now, is that I was really sleeping badly. Like you're either sleeping with huts, uh, in huts with other people. Uh, and I didn't have earplugs at the time. Rookie mistake. Uh, or you sleep. <laughs> a very rookie mistake. Oh, yeah. oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I would just like bundle up my socks and like throw them at people who snort. <laughs> but you're either in these huts or you're in a tent and it could be windy or sand flies or just whatever. Like I would sleep terribly. And so the section after, I was just so tired. And I it, it didn't clock in my 22 year old brain that I just wasn't sleeping enough because we were getting up super early and I was just, oh, oh, I'm just really hungry. That's what it is. So I just kept overeating because I was trying to gain more energy because I was just feeling really lethargic. And I just ended up eating way too much um, because I was trying to get all the energy from food when all I really needed was to like sleep a bit uh, longer in the morning. (laughs) So I I think about that a lot more now. So and this kind of stuff also comes with experience, right? Like you know how your body reacts And I'll say also getting a bit older, while you probably recover quicker when you're younger, I'd say that as I've gotten older, my stamina has also gotten better. There were so many moments on on the TA where, you know, you're at the bottom of this enormous incline, like 2000 meter climb or whatever, and it's so steep and it's hot and you just lean over your trekking poles and you're like, I'm dying. (laughs) This is awful. Whereas when you get a bit older, you become a bit more zen and you're like, oh, well, you know this too like everything else shot has <laughs> so you kind of become a bit uh, more used to things being difficult uh, in that regard and become a bit more physically resilient i think uh i think there's something to be said for just like getting those miles in and and that muscle memory but i think my hardest moments on trail in terms of like my worst trail experience wasn't really on the ta on the whole like we had really great luck with weather and all that kind of stuff but uh i think the worst moment i've ever had on a trail was on the GR20, uh, which is a really mountainous trail that goes across Corsica. It's kind of known as like the toughest long distance trail in Europe. And while I certainly haven't done them all, I do believe it. <laughs> it's very difficult. And on the GR20, uh, we had an enormous thunderstorm uh, when I was quite close to the finish line. And we were all kind of camped up uh, next to this mountain refuge on this plateau in the mountains. We were quite high up. And I knew that that refuge had just been rebuilt because the previous one had been struck by lightning. <laughs> and so we, I mean, everyone who was there was just literally sheltering in like, what's it called? Like child's post, <laughs> child's post, just crawled up like a pretzel in our tent while this horrible thunderstorm is over us for two hours, you know, and even though you've got your eyes like clamped shut, you can still feel that you're getting blinded by the lightning and the thunder is just so loud and yeah i thought i was gonna die (laughs) who'd say that i actually do have a bit of thunderstorm ptsd to the point where even when i experience thunderstorms in london now like i don't kind of like it anymore and when i'm out on on trails now i always think about you know oh my god (laughs) would this be a bad place to be in a thunderstorm so um yeah you live and learn how to sort of work around nature uh, because nature is obviously indifferent to your survival. <laughs> and that's kind of something that you need to think about when you prepare. Um, but also just planning ahead for scenarios like 
um, you know, if something happens, do I, do I know like the bailout routes? If I start feeling sick in this way, do I know how to deal with it? Do I know what's in my first aid kit? Do I know how to use it? Like carrying a personal locator beacon in case of an emergency, stuff like that. I always felt like I had good contingencies in place if I ever had to bail out, which I had to on the GR20 because of that thunderstorm. So sometimes you actually have to give up. Uh, like even finishing a trail or like doing a great section that you really want to do because stuff just gets in the way. And as someone who's, I think from nature side, quite stubborn and quite rigid in my mindset, that is an exercise in flexibility that I had to learn the hard way. So you're working in London now, you're working in human rights, but you do have, you know, you've obviously got this passion for for hiking and, and trekking and, you know, having outdoor adventures. How do you make that work with your London lifestyle you know what does that look like I mean do you do you get like is it just three weeks holiday a year do you take that in one go are you more of a a weekend warrior you know are you looking to take sabbaticals you know what does that look like it's an excellent question that I've increasingly had to had to grapple with I think now that I live sort of within the bounds of my busy London life my hiking journeys look a bit different. You know, the TA I had to do uh, sort of between jobs when I'd finished my undergrad and before my MA because I had that chunk of time and now I don't really have that anymore. Although I will say that I actually have two jobs and combined, I still have quite a bit of flexibility. So I do prioritize through hikes during my holiday. So I'll typically do like a big one in summer and then spend bank holiday weekends and stuff um, doing like smaller hikes around the UK. I'm like endlessly exploring Wales and Scotland and southwestern England because it's just so beautiful. And I'm very lucky to live in North London near Hampstead Heath, which is this beautiful forest park with a bit of actual up and down terrain, which unlike the rest of London, which is not uh, the rest of London is just like flat as a pancake. So having Hampstead Heath, you actually do get to activate your glutes, which is great. Um, So I spend as much time as I can there nearly every day between March and October. I also climb. I climb indoors now, which is a hobby that I took up later, but absolutely love. So I try to do that every single week so that I sort of stay fit and stay active and squeeze in my adventures as often as I can. And I'm prioritizing those bigger trips during summer. But I'm not going to lie, in winter, I hibernate. And I think that human as humans, as mammals, you know, this is a memo that we really missed. We should obviously be hibernating in winter. You actually mentioned this um, after the Tierra Roa Trail, sort of dealing with like post-trail blues or post-adventure blues. What have you found out that has worked for you? So that's a really good question. And the TA is the only through hike where I've really grappled with it afterwards. But one of the things that I try to do is that I make lots and lots and lots of plans when I come back so that I'm a very social person. I'm very extrovert. I love seeing people. So I make lots of social plans and hang out with friends. I think about the next adventure that I want to do because just like you, I have a list of trails that I want to accomplish. I go climbing. I try to not make the transition from trail life to normal life too stark. That said, I also do accept that sometimes you will just have a bit of a down period. I remember coming off of the GR11 uh, in the Pyrenees in Spain, which I did in 2022, and coming back to my mostly working from home office job, where I genuinely just felt like I was spending my best years like the grandparents and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, <laughs> just in bed. And that transition was quite difficult because on the trail, you know, you're seeing all these beautiful things. The hours kind of float by, whereas I was just sitting and staring at my computer and being like, how on earth has it only been 40 minutes? You know, that day is really dragging by. And sometimes you can't really avoid that. But I would just say, like, take take care of your schedule as much as you can in the sense that you fill your life with fun things so that it's not like, oh, you know, a return to the dreary every day. But it's still make your life as fun as you can. And I will say that in that regard, I am lucky, but that is also why I've chosen to live in London. I mean, I could have moved back to Norway where my life, you know, I would have probably had a higher standard of living, but my life would have been smaller in the sense that, you know, there are fewer people around, there's less to do. Whereas in London, I feel like you can kind of endlessly discover the city and there's tons of events to go to and it's really easy to sort of stimulate yourself. So I love the wilderness through hiking, but I also do love my London city life. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. 
one of the hikes that you've done, which I'm absolutely fascinated about and would love to hear hear more from you. It's written, um, you've written a blog post about it. It's, it's called the GR11, um, called Dark Sunshine. But would you, <laughs> would you like to explain what the GR11 is? Um, and just maybe just more about what your experience was like on that trail. Yeah, I'm really glad you asked because I feel like the GR11 does not get enough PR and recognition, which is should because it has by far been my favorite through hike in Europe. The GR11 is one of three trails that crosses the Pyrenees. So the Pyrenees are a mountain chain between uh, northern Spain and southern France. It goes parallel to the GR10 on the French side. The GR11 is on the Spanish side. And then you've got the Haute Route Pyrenees that goes in between the two. I chose the Spanish side because I like Spanish people <laughs> and um, also it has way better weather than the French side. And that's quite important to me. I'm still, I'm still Goldilocks when it comes to sunshine. Um, but no, the GR11 is absolutely stunning. The trail in its entirety is about 800 kilometers, slightly more. And I did about 500 of them through the central Pyrenees because annually limitations, but it is absolutely beautiful like i call it the pacific crest trail of europe because i do think that you traverse a lot of similar looking landscape you've got that really lush kind of needle forest but also these incredible mountains you've got mountain refuges but you can also choose to camp it's just got really spectacular scenery great climate it does have an issue with thunderstorms as well so you do need to think about that but in terms of logistics as well, it's really easy to plan because it goes through so many little villages and stuff. So resupply is not a problem. I think for any hiker looking for a kind of a solid long distance trail that they want to do in Europe without having to go to America and deal with permits and all that kind of stuff, go for the GR11. Like it is awesome. That's, that's one of the trails that I could see myself kind of revisiting and coming back to, um, and redoing sections because it was just so great. And, and it trafficked enough that you get to meet people, which I think is nice. I don't like when it's completely, you know, desolation. Um, but it's not so crowded mostly that, you know, you feel like you're hiking in a queue and stuff as, as I hear is some people experience on, uh, trails like the Appalachian Trail in the US. So yeah, 10 out of 10. I really, really endorse the GR11. And how was the um the altitude and the elevation change? Is it quite because I'm, <laughs> so I'm like I'm saying, that's a really stupid question because it's in the Pyrenees. But like, is it like constant climbing? Did you feel safe climbing? Was it more scrambly, um, or is it quite sort of um, not like donkey tracks, but you know, like um, like good walking tracks, or is it more sort of more challenging than that? Yeah, so I think I had done the GR20 and of course I got the difficult one before. And I think if you've done the GR20, you can do anything. <laughs> so it was definitely less scrambly than that. It's got like a couple of scrambly sections where you're like, whoa, that was really intense. But other than that, it's, it is a lot of up and down. I mean, it is in the mountains. It is like the John Muir Trail, although slightly lower. And um, so you won't be walking level <laughs> for that much of the time. It's really funny when you hike in the UK. And uh, you meet people who hike like in the hills of the UK and they're like, wow, it's so steep. And you're like, actually, <laughs> is it? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, so, so it's definitely mountainous up and down. And it's like, it's a mountain trail. So you'll definitely feel the remoteness in some sections. But I would think for the kind of moderately experienced through hiker, it is, it's not a problem. Yeah. I was just thinking, um, it, it made me laugh the other day because, um, I was on a Camino in Spain walking from Seville and there was uh, like some muddy sections. And so I took like a photo to share it, like, you know, Spain and mud, like sort of a bit tongue in cheek, just because after, you know, Longwood Forest at the bottom of the of the mm -hmm. South Island, <laughs> or bluff where you're literally up to, well, up to, up to my knees, but I'm quite tall. So if you're not tall, it will be up to like mid thigh or you know, waste on some people. And uh, one of my Australian friends, Destroyer, like messaged me back saying, you call that mud? Like, <laughs> <laughs> it is like nothing. So it is, um, it is definitely all all sort of all sort of relative um, and what future plans future walks but I I know people always sometimes hate being asked this question but I love asking this question because I love getting inspiration from other people so it's always like oh what 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 it might you be doing yeah no absolutely and I have no intentions of stopping through hiking anytime soon and you know even if I'm not through hiking I'll be doing like through skiing where I do like a long uh, cross-country ski 
at my cabin and stuff in the mountains. So I did that last Easter. And my immediate trail plans is that I'm going to be doing a section of the Pacific Crest Trail, finally returning to the homeland, so to speak, in Northern California in July of this year. So I'm very, very excited to get back onto American trails just because there's a bit of a different culture around through hiking in America. Like you have trail names and it's a real community that I'm very excited to get back to. So that's going to be great. And my partner is going to be joining me for a bit of it, which is kind of a new thing for me because I mostly hike solo, but hopefully he'll keep up and then I'll do a bit of it by myself as well. So that's going to be very exciting. And I'm hoping to one day piece together the entire Pacific Crest Trail, just one annual leave quota at a time so that one day I'll have, I'll have the whole thing. Um, but I've got lots of different trails that I would love to do. I'd love to explore the UK more, but also places like the Colorado Trail and the Great Dubai Trail in Canada, the Kungsleden in Sweden, the, I don't really know how to pronounce it, but the, the Laugavagur Trail in Iceland that I was supposed to do in uh, RIP 2020. Um, so lots of different trails on the agenda, but immediately it is the Pacific Crest Trail, which I'm very excited about. Oh, fantastic. And I should ask, you know, when you did the John Muir Trail, did you get a trail name? I did, yeah. My trail name is White Blaze. Uh, so I'm quite happy with it because all of my gear was by despicable coincidence, all pink on that trail. So I'm so afraid that I was going to be called like Pink Lady or something. But no, my trail name is White Blaze, which sounds fancy, but it comes from something a bit dumb because uh, on my first day on the John Muir Trail, when you walk southbound, you've got the sun behind you mostly. And so my calves have gotten really, really sunburned. And I had the sunscreen stick that I kind of raked up my calves. And it looked like the white blazes that are the trail markers on the Appalachian Trail. So a midwife from San Francisco that I met on that day named me White Blaze in honor of my sunscreen marks on my calves. <laughs> Love it. And Kristen, <laughs> where can people follow along with your adventures and challenges and read more about your blogs? Where are you most active on social media? So I'm mainly on Instagram on let's.trek.it and on my main web page, which is my blog, it is letstrekit.com. And yeah, the blog has uh, day blogs from every single one of my through hikes. So there's there's about two and a half PhDs worth of content on that now, so I'm hoping it's not just my mother reading it. <laughs> but also uh, tracking tips where I talk about hiking, climbing, gear reviews, um, resupply, logistics, every single aspect related to like through hiking and outdoor adventures. And there's also a contact form uh, where people can ask me for like personal advice if they want to ask specific questions. Fantastic. And Kristen, I'd love for you to have the final words, final words of advice and wisdom for other women who want to trek more, hike more, walk more, spend more time in the great outdoors. What advice would you like to share? But please don't say just do it. Um, you can take that in any direction that you would like. Yeah. So I really believe in the power of inspiration. I mean, that's what this podcast is all about. And that's how I found through hiking. And I want to say that, you know, you have to dare to act on an idea because there's no reason why it can't be you. I mean, do your research, start small and then work your way up just like you would with any hobby, but don't rob yourself of what is going to be one of the greatest achievements of your life. Like I was saying, the Tierra de Nova is always going to be the crown jewel of my life. And every single time I'm out there on a hike, I think, you know, how lucky I am to be there. So really allow yourself to be inspired by the spectacular and the extraordinary and kind of dream big because chances are that you will achieve it. I'm a firm believer that most people can do most things. And I think the diversity of experiences that you've showcased on this podcast is a testament to that. I think that, you know, if you really, if you pick an adventure and you really, really want to do it and you do research, you ask for advice, you talk to people, you probably will achieve it. So there's no time to start like today, honestly. Absolutely. I love what you first said. Dare to act on an idea. Absolutely. Kristen, thank you so much for coming on Tough Girl Podcast. It's been amazing to speak to you and just best of luck with uh, with heading off to America to do the PCT and all your future hikes and adventures. Thank you so much, Sarah. Hey, 
Hey tribe, I really hope you enjoyed the episode with Kristen. What an incredible woman. I love the fact that she is sharing her adventures on her blog, Let's Track It, to inspire others to undertake their own wilderness journeys. I'm sure you will agree that she provided lots of top tips and advice to inspire all of us to get out there and to take on new challenges. Massive thank you to Innovate for sponsoring this episode and for sponsoring all of the episodes in June. It's amazing to work with Innovate again and to share more about their incredible products and clothing and and gear. You will know that I've been wearing Innovate now for a number of years and I wear their products on all of my adventures and challenges. Most recently when I was out in New Zealand hiking the Tiara Road Trail, on the Camino, on the Cotswold Way and I will also be wearing their gear on my next big challenge which will be walking the South West Coast Path 630 miles starting in Pool Harbour and ending up in Chepstow. Not mine head, Chepstow because I'm going to connect my journeys. As previously, I have walked the Wales Coast Path from Chester all the way to Chepstow and I've also walked Offers Dyke Path from Chepstow up to Prestatyn. So if I join up journeys walking to Chepstow, then that completes a massive section of the southwest, in, you know, Wales, Cornwall, Devon, etc. And that's part of my plan to eventually walk all of the England's coast path. If you're wanting to learn more about the specific items of clothing and trainers that I wear with Innovate, if you visit toughgirlchallenge.com forward slash March Daily Mile to all the episodes where we've spoken to, to women on the Tough Girl podcast from this year, 2024, 2023 and 2022, there is also the reviews on Innovate gear. So the trainers that I wore on the the North Island, the Rockfly G350, the trainers that I wore on the South Island, the Rockfly G350 GTX Women's, which is the world's first waterproof hiking shoe, the Parklaw G280 trainers. And remember, the G280 is basically just grams 280s. That's just the weight of the weight of the shoe. I've also, on the Wales Coast Path, I wore the Innovate hiking boots. There's a review on them, the Rockfly G390, so it weighs 390 grams. And then one of my favourite shoes, which I wore pretty much throughout all of 2023, which is a Trailfly Ultra G300 Max Women's. They were like my purple trainers. They've got lots of sort of extra padding. And they probably did over a thousand miles. So that was on uh, the Camino, um, the from Camino of St. James, from St. Jean Pierre to Port to, to Santiago, the Isle of Man Coastal Path, the Coast to Coast. There was another event, Offers Dyke. Yes, they've, they've been on lots of adventures with me. So please do go check out the website. You can use the discount code TOUGHGIRL15, TOUGHGIRL15 to get 15% off your gear and your purchases. But if you do have any questions, then please do send me a DM. I am most active on Instagram at Tough Girl Challenges. Thank you again for listening to all of these incredible women who are sharing their stories on the Tough Girl podcast. Massive thank you again to Innovate for supporting the work that I do to increase the amount of female role models in the media especially in relation to adventure and physical challenges all that's left for me to say is wherever you are whatever you are doing give it your all give it 110 percent. get after it go for it believe in yourself because i believe in you take care lots of love and i'll speak to you soon 